All right, this would be really cool. We're gonna get to hear from some, uh, some companies who we know a little bit less about. This is our Rising Stars of Discovery panel. Coming up on the stage right now, we have Matt Rosoff, Editorial Director of Business Insider, and he'll be talking with Damian Patton, uh, CEO and co-founder of Banjo, Nirav Tolia, co-founder and CEO of Nextdoor, Christian Taylor, founder and CEO of Pavement, and Grant Wernick, CEO of Wiata. Come on up, guys. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, how's it going? Great, um, awesome. I want to I start off by asking each of you briefly: um, How does one become a rising star of social discovery? What did, <laughs> what, where, where did that come from? And, and what have you done right? And what can we all learn from you? I'm not sure how one becomes a rising star, but I did see if it was available on Twitter, so I could change my Twitter name to Rising Star. And yeah. someone had already taken it; that was more vain than that. So. Right. Now, how did you guys do it? I mean, you're up to, you, you've had pretty explosive growth compared with uh, a couple other folks who are doing similar things. So how'd Banjo do it? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, the reason Banjo is growing so fast is, is really uh, threefold. Number one is the technology, uh, I truly believe, is superior than, than most things that are out there in the location space. But number two in, in, is our team, an incredible team of, of, of engineers um, that put this together. But number three, and the most important uh, aspect of the way we've grown, as we truly listen to users, we don't just hear our users, we actually really listen to them. We do uh, user focus groups uh, almost every single day of the week. Before I launched Banjo, I tested it with almost 6,000 people. And because of that, getting that kind of user feedback and putting it into action very, very quickly has enabled us to grow very fast. Okay. What do you guys have any, any tips for folks uh, before we sort of get into other things? On how to become a rising star. Yeah, I mean, wait, how, do you, how, do you grow, how do you grow momentum from zero? Oh, well, I mean, the case of Pavement, it was, it was sort of this no-brainer move that happened. You know, I mean, we, we came out right at the point where, uh, you know, the idea of Facebook page, the company's been around for about three years. So we saw this pivotal point where, you know, every single, you know, human with a pulse was coming to Facebook. And not only that, um, it was at a time where Facebook was really just launching pages for brands. So there was essentially this party happening with no music playing. You know, all these brands were there to, to essentially sell something. Uh, you know, to Facebook users, and there was no mechanism to be able to do that. So, for us, it was just a no-brainer of finding a this this just dumb moment of going, well, somebody needs to do that. Okay, I, I think generally yeah. speaking, there are rising stars of social because of Facebook. Okay. I think Facebook is so mainstream and it's so big and so well accepted that many ideas that might have seen seemed inconceivable before are now very, very easily accepted and almost obvious. And so for us with Nextdoor, we're trying to connect neighbors in a social way. It's a very different thing than connecting with friends. And maybe four or five years ago, if I'd said, wouldn't you want to communicate with your neighbors via email? Wouldn't you want an easy way to read a news feed of things that are going on in your neighborhood? People would say, no, I just want to go outside and knock on my neighbor's door or I want to right. keep to myself. But with the emergence of Facebook, it's really made it normal and okay and accepted to interact in this social way. And I never wanted to do that. I love your service. I never want to talk to my neighbors. I, I love the fact there's a social network. I don't have to talk to them anymore. It's awesome. <laughs> um, interesting question for you, Nirav, uh, about Nextdoor. Um, you guys don't currently have a mobile app, correct? How important do you think mobile is and the intersection between mobile and social? I mean, to me, when I think about social discovery, I think a lot of it, it's not just who you know, but where you are right now, and that seems to be important. And I know we've kind of got, got a split here on the panel with two, two very mobile-focused apps and, and two less, more web-focused, so start with you on that. We think it's critical, and you're right. We don't have a mobile app today. Now, most of our content is delivered via email, so if you have a phone that receives email, you can experience the service on that phone. So it, it, we just don't have a dedicated mobile app. And we do think that it's really the intersection, as you said, of social, mobile, and local. But for us, our user base is, is, is one that's a lot less sophisticated and a lot less early adopter than most of Silicon Valley. And so many of the people who start using Nextdoor are folks who have been community organizers for 10, 20, 30 years. And for them, it was actually easier to access a web app first. And so our plan has always been to first build the website. We actually have a process where when you first start a next door neighborhood website, you have to draw a boundary around your neighborhood. That's a lot harder to do on a small screen than it is on a computer screen. But over time, we expect a lot of the usage to go to mobile. Grant, what do you think about mobile? Well, we just launched our new mobile product two and a half weeks ago, We Ought to Go. It's kind of awesome if, if you guys haven't checked it out. It's pretty amazing. Um, 
making things really, really, really simple and put all of the complexity and all the data behind it so that the user sees something that's beautiful, that's simple, that's gorgeous. When we first launched at TechCrunch Disrupt, we built a web product. And that web product it did, did pretty well. People really liked it. In fact, we're relaunching that later on this summer. But as soon as we launched this mobile piece for this here and now moment that people are always experiencing and put a really addictive, fun, engaging interface, I won't spoil it for you guys. It's kind of awesome if you haven't tried it yet. Um, it just expanding super fast. Our user retention's pretty ridiculous. It's like 75% of the people who have the app now come, have come back more than three times in what, three weeks. What's your usage breakdown, web versus mobile? Uh, much heavier, much heavier on mobile. Okay. And it's pretty interesting. Our usage breakdown for web tends to be mostly female and mostly women in their mid-30s who are planning. Um, and our, our breakdown on mobile is a much, much um, more of a mixed crowd and a much more of a mid-20s crowd uh, and a lot more guys. Yeah, don't you think mobile... Guys don't plan very well, Mobile's more necessary for spontaneity. I mean, that's kind of the whole point of Banjo, right? I mean, you, you, you sort of have this spontaneous moment where two people are in the same place at the same time. Yeah, and the way I look at mobile versus web, it's, it's like this. I mean, you may leave the, your house and leave your wallet at home, but you're sure not going to leave your mobile phone at home, right? And so think about it. I mean, some of us have probably left our mobile phone at home and have actually turned around to get it, but we wouldn't turn around to get our wallet. Like, ah, well, if we get pulled over by a cop today, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Uh, but we're not going to figure out how to live without our mobile device. And the reality of it is, is because of that spontaneity that happens, we're always on the go. And one of the core components of Banjo is being able to notify us of those things that are important uh, to us that are happening that we would otherwise miss out. And that's not possible. Not, we're not going to be carrying around our laptop, uh, per se. It's our mobile phones that are in our pockets or purses or what have you every day that can give you that notification in that moment. Can, can you have a, a successful social company without an app? And can you have a successful social company only with an app without a website? I, I don't In this day and age going forward, if you were launching today from scratch and you were going to do web only, I, I think it would be very daunting. Um, I think most companies, I mean, if you look at even uh, companies like Facebook who've been primarily uh, web, they, you know, they talk about how they're going to become a mobile company in the next couple of years. And other social networks that have been very heavy web have put a lot more emphasis on mobile, and there's a reason why. Um, on the opposite end, can you, can you just be mobile only? Sure. I mean, absolutely. I mean, let's just look at Instagram. Uh, while they did do some things where pictures were shared online, uh, everything to come back into the application to sign up was done through mobile. And we are mostly, I would say, you know, 99% mobile. Banjo is. Um, we grow by 10 to 30,000 users uh, every single day, um, 10,000 to 30,000 users a day. And, and because of that, We've looked at going back and doing some things in the web, and we've tested some things out, but it just, um, it's just not the growth area that, that we see for the future. Christian, what do you think about that? Do you, I mean, do you need a mobile component? Can you be web only? Oh, well, definitely. I mean, if you're building a company nowadays and you're not thinking about mobile, you're, you're over before you even started. I mean, our, with our numbers, because we live within other social networks, um, you know, we are an app per se. I mean, we're, we're built into Facebook. We're built into Twitter today. Um, and our traffic is obviously exactly what, what Facebook sees. You know, 50% of our traffic is coming from mobile. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times we have to kick the bus over at Facebook to help, you know, it's like, guys, let's, you know, Let's, let's try to, you know, come up with a better platform to help us, you know, hit your mobile users kind of thing, um, you know, but it's, you know. Do you think they're going to be able to come up with a better mobile what's platform? What's that? Do you think they're going to be able to come up with a better mobile yes, platform? Yes, I mean, I, I, you know, we go over there once a month just to have talks with their mobile people and tell them what we're saying. We're very open, you know, we, we can tell them this is how people are shopping. If you add these features, this will help people shop, discover, you know, those kind of things. So I think they're very in tune with talking to the, you know, sort of the top players of their platform to make sure that mobile is executed correctly when it comes to the app ecosystem. If nothing else, Facebook will acquire their way into mobile. Uh, what, what do you think, Grant, about... Do you, I mean... I think mobile is a piece of it. Okay. It's not everything. To be a company... I'm a firm believer to be a company in tech these days that the web is not dead. And that the web is going to be even more amazing and more interwoven between mobile and the web. I mean, look at the company Tagged. Tagged's web presence is amazing, and what they're going to do on mobile with their next release is going to be unreal, but it's going to really meld the two together. And we ought to going to do the same kind of stuff. We're really going to be melding those two, two worlds together. 
But, but why do you need that desktop presence at all? Why, why can't you just, if you were starting... How, how many people have mobile phones and smartphones in the world, and how many people have access to the web? I don't know. I think it's, 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 it's catching up. I mean, it depends on where you are, right? A lot of people's first internet access is coming on their smartphone. How much easier is it, is it to market something on the web compared to market something on mobile? And how many mobile apps are marketed yeah, on the web? Still. I'd like to bring up an interesting point, though, about the future of mobile. It's like I have a 16-year-old niece who knows nothing more than her phone. That is the internet to her. You know, I mean, there's a certain age demographic that's coming up, and it's coming. And these are the people that are going to be using your app more and more. And she's, you know, she's in high school. She's she's connected to her phone. I'm sitting there. She's like, you know, uh, just nonstop. What, and I'm asking what she's doing. She's like, well, I'm on the internet. You know, and that's her, that's her internet. Um, she doesn't have a computer, she doesn't, and that's the way she communicates with her friends, that's the way that she, she interacts with the world. She doesn't know, she doesn't know a desktop web. Yeah, let's um, well, we'll switch, switch gears a little bit and talk about another issue that comes up all the time when we talk about social, and that's uh, the privacy issue. So, um, you know, Banjo is sort of an example here, even the most positive reviews sometimes mention this kind of creepy factor, like I don't necessarily want people to know I'm near them at this particular moment. Uh, where do you think the boundaries are, and, and how, do you, how do you calm people to, uh, uh, to sort of accept that, that you know, there's this, this moving line with their privacy versus their connectivity to the world? Yeah, so when we started Banjo, we knew location. It was going to be a big deal as far as privacy goes, and something being new as in social discovery. Anytime you do anything new, when Facebook first came out or any new social network comes out, there's always this you know, uncertainty about it. So we took privacy head on, and one of the important things that Banjo did from day one, uh, and we've gotten much better at it with user feedback, is making sure that the people that you see on Banjo are only the intended audience. And what does that mean? Uh, that means that if you open up Banjo right now and you happen to see anybody from Facebook, you're only going to see the people on Facebook that you actually have permission to see because they're your friends on Facebook. You're not going to see any public Banjo user that has a Facebook account, their location. We don't broadcast anybody's location unless you've done some social action in Instagram and Foursquare and Twitter to do that. Uh, and the reason why is those, you asked why, you know, how do those people feel comfortable? Those people are sharing. I mean, people that are sharing on Instagram and on, and on uh, Twitter they're doing that so people in the public, they can, uh, they can comment, you know, you're getting, uh, if you will, validation on the stuff that you're sharing. So people want to be discovered. People want comments. People want people to follow them on Twitter. Or else they, they would simply have their account set on private, and then Banjo would respect that. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I guess it seems like there's sort of a natural tension, though. Where is the, where's the line? Like, what's the right amount? I mean, with Nextdoor, it's kind of your neighborhood, but you have to be, you have to prove that you are a member of that neighborhood before you can join that. So that's sort of an interesting privacy. Yeah, what, what we found is that privacy has really become an ideological issue for people. Hmm. They don't always look at the specifics of the controls you give them, but they, they have a perception of the service. And if you don't actually serve that perception, they won't trust you. And so specifically when we thought about next door and we realized that people would be talking about their homes and their children and you know things that have to do with the real physical world, we realized that privacy was the most important thing for us. And, and what did that mean for us from a product standpoint? Well, it meant that we had to deal with lots of friction that people don't normally deal with. For example, none of the content that's shared on next door is indexed by Google. So we have no SEO whatsoever. You have to verify that you actually live in the neighborhood. So for a large number of our users, you can verify a variety of different ways. You can wait for us to send you a postcard. You can enter your credit card number so we can match it to your billing address. Or if you have a home phone, we can do a directory lookup and, and send you a code. But the majority of people want the free postcard. So what that means is when you join next door, you're on the verge of joining the service, and all of a sudden we say, sorry, you can't see anything until you get the postcard, enter the code, and then come in. And we know that's frustrating to people. We know that once they hear about Nextdoor, whether it's because they've heard about it from a friend or they've read an article or any other way, they want to experience it right then and there. That's the generation that we are. We download an app, we visit a web page, we immediately consume it. But we have had to actually put this friction in place because we believe that ideologically, we have to make an extremely strong point that privacy is our number one priority. And we prove that out through the product. Yeah, what about you, Grant? That's an interesting question. Well, we kind of did exactly the opposite. I mean, you and I were talking about this earlier. We decided to remove all friction points and make it really, really simple to get into the app, to engage with the app from the second you start with Wiata. 
And later on, where you have a bunch of social plans I was sharing with, with you earlier, um, our social plans will be very purposeful and they will be um, a value add. And we'll be very open about those kinds of things, very, very much like these are the only people that really matter to you. It won't be your entire social graph. It'll be, oh, that one friend that actually is, is, has similar taste to you on the app as you've been using it uh, on, let's say, Sushi, and another friend who really likes events and that are similar to you, and you'll see that kind of stuff. Um, but you will be really, really, really tight all the time, so we never actually will get too deep into that privacy issue. Have people's social graphs gotten too big, right? I mean, you've got, you know, you have Facebook, they're, and then you've they're got... They're ridiculous. I mean, look at, look <laughs> at all of ours. Right, and it goes all the way down to pair now. Well, you've got a, a social graph of two. Does that make sense? Do we need that interaction to be socially brokered? <laughs> I think we're going to enter a world, and you and I were talking about this earlier, we're going to enter a world where some people are going to get uber, 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 uber social, and they're going to want every single part of their life broadcast. They're going to want to go to the store and see in that like, hangar that, oh, five of my friends thought this was awesome. But we're also going to be like three or five, maybe three to five years down the road, we're going to see another group of people that's going to pull away from social and it's going to want a lot more privacy and a lot more solo experience. And it's going to be a really interesting world to be part of. We get to be part of it. I mean, it's almost like yeah, with Facebook, you know, I'm not on Facebook. It's like the new, I, I don't have a TV. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of too I, I don't cool need, to I don't be social, either. right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I actually think that the social graph and, and more specifically the, the notion of a graph of people that you know is more scalable than people think. I think if there were one social graph, which is the way that we've thought about it, especially with the emergence of Facebook, that would be very difficult. But what, what is really happening, as I see my own usage, is I have a social graph on Facebook that, re that I rely on, and I have a different graph on LinkedIn that I rely on, and I have a different graph on Twitter that I rely on. And so what we've tried to do with Nextdoor, and I think Path is trying to do this as well, Pear is trying to do this, there are a number of other companies that are trying to build different orthogonal social graphs to Facebook. With Nextdoor, we've said, well, is there a neighborhood graph or a local graph? And we feel like that's different than what already exists. And we learned oh. in Pavement that, uh, you know, Facebook, uh, there, were recently, there wasn't really a social graph that even helped us. When you think about it, you know, what we're trying to do is, I mean, first of all, on the privacy thing, I mean, we, we live right in the world of, of where privacy has to be, you know, uber thought about. I mean, because, I mean, Beacon. we're essentially people putting out their credit cards to make purchases, you know, on Facebook. So... Um, you know, so we've always had the standpoint is, is we're never going to broadcast what you're shopping. You know, I mean, first of all, your friends or family there, you know, you might be buying them one of them a gift. It just doesn't make sense, you know, in, in a shopping context. But where we do use social discovery is in the other way around, is using the social graph to help target products against people. So in other words, you come into any store and we go, you know, hey, we know you're really into this. Out of these 165,000 sellers we have, you might like this, this, and this, and this. And really coming up with a... But early on, we figured out that Facebook's social graph really didn't work for that. And we think about it, you don't have much in common when it comes to your friends and family on Facebook. Uh, these are people that you're, you know, friends, family, people you went to college together, but rarely do you like the same books, rarely do you like the same music. It's not an interest graph. So very early, we had to sort of reinvent uh, you know, our own graph by, you know, essentially building it from scratch. What do you think about Twitter building an interest graph? Well, Twitter's got a much better interest graph when it comes to targeting shopping. I mean, we use Twitter's uh, interest graph. Because you're definitely, I mean, it's people following a brand that they might already be really into compared to, well, I'm following you because I went to college with you or that kind of thing. There's actually a really cool site. It's just a kind of experiment called socialislands.com. And if you guys go there, you guys can plug in your Facebook network to it and it'll show you your whole social network in a really cool visual way. And you'll see all your college friends over here and your high school friends over here. And it's really accurate and interesting. You guys should take a look at it. Um, I have a question. It's actually a good question that came in via Twitter for Nirav specifically. Um, you sort of mentioned that Facebook and the rise of Facebook has made your business possible and made a lot of other social businesses possible. What happens when and if Facebook changes the game? Or what happens if Facebook decides to add your product, any of your products as a feature? And uh, you know, kind of reminds me of when Google was the dominant platform, and you know, uh, all these all these other companies uh, grew up to be dependent on on Google and SEO and that kind of thing. Yeah, it's it's a constant question that we get: isn't what you're building Facebook for neighborhoods? And what happens when Facebook actually builds a neighborhood application? And it's certainly something that we think about. We started from a premise that on Facebook you connect with people that you're friends to, whereas on Nextdoor you connect with people that you're not friends to, and in many cases you may not even know but you happen to share a neighborhood with them. So I think the key for us and, and the key for companies that 
don't want to potentially be subsumed by Facebook, is to try to define a value proposition that's truly orthogonal or different, right? And, and ultimately, you'll know it because you can ask yourself when you're using the product, would I see this on Facebook, right? Would I experience this on Facebook, right? And I think many, many people thought in the early days of Twitter that it would be subsumed by Facebook. And all you have to do is use Twitter to understand how different it is than Facebook, right? Those things will always be distinct. So there's no telling what Facebook can do because it's an incredible company and it has incredible resources and obviously 900 million users, you know, will let you expose the biggest audience in the world to anything. But as long as you define something that's truly different, I think you have a chance to survive outside that ecosystem. Oh, and I remember when, uh, was it, was, it wasn't that long ago, like what, a year ago, that oh, Foursquare's dead. You know, Foursquare's dead. They're getting into location. Oh, shit. You know, right. you know where are they going to pivot to? Kind of, I mean, you, yeah. you know, rewind today, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, Foursquare, you know, in my opinion, still dominates in location, you know. Um, yeah. Facebook's not always good at product, you know. I mean, they'll be the first one in minutes. The reason why they opened up a, a, an ecosystem where developers can really build product on top of that platform. Um, you know, what they're really good at is building that underground pipes that make other products very social. Um, and then at times when they try to get into the top level product thing, um, they're not always successful at it. Foursquare's a, a great example of that. Don't you think the pressure to uh, build products on top of the platform will grow now that they're public? Right, so you take the most profitable niches that somebody else has made a lot of money at and said, oh yeah, we're gonna clone that. You mean just going in and acquiring them? Uh, or, or, or building competitors that, uh, you know, putting full, full resources to bear. Well, I mean, if they wanted to get into sh like, if they wanted to get into our space, you know, I mean, it took us two years to essentially build out the network that we have, and you know, I mean, and essentially everyone's credit card attached to their, you know, Facebook IDs so that they could shop across the network. I mean, those aren't things that they would build overnight. You know, I think, I, I think it's there are some newer companies that come into the space and they're a little bit at a disadvantage because, uh, um, you know, because the. Uh, the platform, it's, it's, in other words, like games, you know, there'll never be another Zanga. Zanga came there really early on when the network, when the developer network was very much in its infancy. They were able to take advantage of a lot of the news feed kind of things, really build a, build a huge gaming company overnight. You know, there will never be a new gaming company that comes to Facebook and has that kind of impact. Um, so I think there's certain companies um, in certain niches uh, that can take advantage of a certain uh, unique time within Facebook's ecosystem to grow a big business. Is Google Plus or any other social network a counterbalance? Google what? Go <laughs> yeah, uh, uh. All right, next Maybe question. question. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, set up, shot down. Um, the, uh, actually, whenever we get a, whenever one of our users posts a product, uh, we actually get a lot of traffic back from Google Plus. And it's, our internal joke is the fact that um, it's because whenever somebody does actually post a product on, on Google+, Plus, you know, it's like, oh my god, there's something new. Click on it, quick, before it goes away. Or it's not posted by a, face, or a Google employee. So, you know, uh, we're actually getting quite a few clickbacks from, from Google+. Plus. Um, so we're running out of time. I, gotta, I gotta have one more question. Um, do you think that the idea of social eventually becomes just like the idea of online? I mean, I remember back in the 90s when something was, you know, everything was e-commerce or it was web this, and does social just become a feature that's everywhere and it doesn't become, it's, it's no longer anything special? Yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, as human beings, we're inherently social. I mean, that's just who we are. And taking it in another form now, putting it online, whether it's on the web or it's on mobile, it's just a different way for us to share and connect with human beings, and that's what we want to do. Um, so I think it's inherent in, in who we are uh, as people, and so I definitely think social is going to become, uh, right now we're, at the, we're still at the emphasis of the technology of what social is, but at the end of the day, uh, it'll just be baked into our everyday lives, and it'll just be something that the generation after us, uh, much like the generation now is still doesn't understand we didn't have a computer, the generation after us is going to understand, not understand when everything wasn't social or social was baked into about every concept. So minority reports really going to happen. Right, what do you guys think about that? Is that, I mean, is social inevitable? Is there always going to be that sort of movement? As I was saying just a few minutes ago, yes, there will be on one side, but there will be the other side of those that pull away from it as well. And I can't wait for that story, Matt. And social, you know, I mean, social is, is the exciting thing about social, it's, it's really going to make web applications, 
my personal opinion is that the internet's been sort of a lonely place. Uh, you know, I mean, a lot of, I mean, you think about it, since the internet, uh, you know, let, let's take shopping for instance. So, uh, you know, Amazon was one of the, you know, early on one of the first ones to really crack the nut when it came to shopping on, on the internet. But what happened was people used to go into stores, used to interact with people, and then it became this very lonely place all of a sudden. And social is really sort of taking a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of the internet and a lot of these apps and then once again making them what they used to be. Um, you know, I think I think social is one of those things where, when it's used right, it feels like a real interaction. It feels like what you used to have um, in the days of, you know, going into a you know a neighborhood meetup, um, or you know, going into a retail store, um, you know, and, and, and getting a recommendation. Um, you know, that's where social really does well. Um, you know, when you try to take you know social and really fit it into something that's weird, or you know, or try to reinvent something with it. Um, it's a, it's really where you see the failures. Um, I think it's I think it's making everything much more uh, like it used to be before the internet. You know, much more personable. Okay, guys, uh, our time is up. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.